Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, we have Coach Dave Taylor. Now, Dave Taylor went to prep school for a postgrad year, played D1, coached D1. In fact, he was my coach at Air Force, and he's also a member of the Prep Athletics team. And on this episode, we talk about some of the major questions that players and their family members ask on a weekly basis about the basketball world. We talk briefly about how to pick an AAU team, how to build a basketball IQ, um, how to pick a basketball trainer, and do you need a basketball trainer? What does it take to make it to the NBA? What do you need to possess to be a college player? And, and a lot more. So it's a great episode. Dave's one of the smartest guys I know in the basketball industry. So it's going to be um, very informative for you guys watching. If you like this, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and subscribe to us on all the major uh, podcasting platforms. If you want to leave a review and subscribe, that would be awesome. Uh, it'd really help get the show out there more. But uh, you know, anyway, I appreciate you appreciate you turning tuning in today for this episode. So here we go, Coach Dave Taylor on the Prep, Prep Athletics Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. All right, Coach Taylor. Welcome to the podcast today. Well, glad to be with you again, Mr. Heights. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, and for those of you who heard in the intro, uh, Dave is my college coach from Air Force. So we go way back. Uh, he's a brother to me. And uh, I think he's one of the most qualified folks to answer some of these questions today. So we are going to talk about some of the top questions that players and their families have in high school basketball. And we're going to start with number one. Um, how should a player pick an AAU team? And that's always a, a question I get, too. I think it's tough because uh, a player, a player naturally wants to go uh, where they think it will be easiest or the most fun or the most glorious, uh, meaning, okay, I'll play for the top five team or I'll play for a team that's got, you know, all these former players that have gone through this program and gone to the big leagues. And, you know, I'll, I'll play for a program that doesn't cost me a lot of money. Um, those are always traps. Uh, you know, as a player, you want to go to a program that's going to challenge you. You want to go to a program with a legitimate coach that has a track record of sending players to the next level. And you want to go to a, a program that plays in all the big events. Um, you, you want to go to a program that's going to be seen by college coaches. But, you know, winning and losing isn't always what's going to get you to that next level. And I think a lot of parents fall into that trap and they'll play on a super team where their child has the role of, uh, you know, a guy that plays 15, 20 minutes a game, just get the ball to the best guy. Um, they don't play on a team where they have to be that guy, where they have to do five or six things and really and really do everything on the floor it might mean they lose a little bit more, but uh, in, in the end, they'll do better for themselves. So, you know, do your due diligence. You, you always have to go and, you know, I would always watch a practice, watch how the coach interacts with his players. Um, do they practice a lot? Is he, uh, is he a disciplined coach? Is he a real coach? Is he a, just a, trying to be everyone's best friend and, and, you know, use them for their own notoriety? So it, it is one of the most important uh, decisions uh, a player will make is even more so than what high school they go to. So uh, I think the most, and it's, it's a choice you can make. You can go anywhere. There's no restrictions. So you really want to go to a, a program that's going to go to the right venues, but also going to challenge you, be hard on you, believe in you, uh, but push you and, and not try to be your friend, but understand that, that they have to be your coach. Let me ask a couple of follow-ups on that. When it comes to winning, if you are on a good team and you make it to the championship game, do those few extra games help you with being seen by more coaches or do coaches take off by the time those games happen? Well, it depends. You know, if you, uh, obviously if you win, you get more games, but uh, you know, what my experience is it's one or two more games. If your role is that of, you know, the third guy off the bench or the eighth man, and you're going to come in and you're going to do a really good job and be fundamentally sound. And, but you're just not going to make any plays because they have three or four other guys that are the stars of that team it doesn't benefit you. You know, you're still just having the same role and the same progress. So, um, you know, you want to be on a team that, that doesn't lose every game by 25 points. Don't get me wrong, but you want to be in a program that's going to be, you know, a team that wins a couple of playoff games, maybe loses in the round of 16, but you know, you can really get some good film because to be honest with you, you know, does your, does your program film games? Right. Do they do film? Do they do things like that? Because that's going to get you seen 
you know, how many coaches are at these games? You know, now with live streaming and the ability to video, you can really video these games, send them out to a bunch of people. But if you have an extended role where you have to rebound, pass, set the screens, you know, run the program, uh, be the leader, hit the big shots, be, you know, do all that. Um, it's going to make you more, uh, you know, prestigious, more, more uh, recruitable to these college coaches. Right. Right. You mentioned that you got to find a coach that um, develops and has connections and does things the right way. That probably, that's a lot to ask. Are those guys out there in like every region in America? Yeah, they are. And, okay. you know, I'm one of those, you know, but you, you, uh, you're not going to get those guys that are very often uh, sponsored, you know, uh, shoe sponsors and sometimes they have to answer and they have to win you know they have to win so in order to maintain those sponsorships and to maintain that money uh they have to continue to win but usually you know i'm a former division one coach as you mentioned i coached you at the division one level so you know uh when you get those kind of coaches they kind of understand what what it takes to be successful and what it means to get to the next level i'm not a guy that recruits players so they come to me and I let them know up front, I'm not easy to play for, but if you do what I say, I'll get you to the next level, whatever level that may be. But um, they, they are out there. But it's, again, they're not the ones that are going to be flashing and, and, you know, out there and showboating and, and having a bunch of accolades. They're the ones that are out there, you know, grinding it out, but doing it right. And there's, there's quite a few out there. You just got to find them. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, question two, and this, we can relay this to high school, prep school, and AAU. Is it better to be a guy on a team where you're getting more minutes on the court in games, or is it better to be on a team with more talent where you might not be getting as many uh, game time minutes, but every day in practice you're getting challenged and have to play at a higher level? What's your thought on that? Well, I mean, uh, you know, that's a great question, and, and you can go either way on it, to be honest with you. I know that if you're a guy that wants to, uh, you know, demonstrate his talents and get on the floor and be on a team that's going to be able to show the world what you can do, I think that's better. I think it's better that you play um, more and get more film and be able to show coaches what you can do on you know, a national stage. But that being said, you know, if you are on a super team, uh, then the question again comes down to coaching. Even though you're not getting minutes and you're playing against these superstar players that are all you know high majors, mid majors, whatever you may see, but is that coach going to send them film out and then fight for you and tell people that, Hey, this kid didn't get a lot of minutes, but it's only because we had three high majors in his position. So if you have a good coach that can get the word out, that can kind of get your, you know, sell you as a player, um, you can benefit from that as well. But for me, the better benefit would be to be on the court playing. I think it helps you. But, um, but again, if you're not playing, there is a benefit if you have a good coach. Yeah. It's it's a million dollar question that people ask all the time, and we deal with that in the prep school world. With you know, a kid might be looking at a single A team that just doesn't have that much talent on it, versus like a triple A team which might have ten D one guys on it. And I think it comes down, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, on just each individual kid and kind of what they want. Some kids might want to get pressed every day in practice and guard a guy, maybe going to the SEC or the ACC, and other kids want to get on the court and get those minutes in. So does it come down ultimately to what the kid wants to potentially? Always. It always comes down to where they feel most comfortable. I mean, I always tell the story of Swen Nader. Um, I know nobody knows who he is, but um, he backed up Bill Walton at UCLA, played maybe 45 minutes in his entire career, um, goes into the NBA as a first round draft pick, leads the NBA in rebounding. So, um, you know, you, just because you're not playing doesn't mean you're not good. It just might mean that the guy ahead of you is, is really, really good. So, uh, again, I think it just comes down to, to what the player wants. And uh, I, I think a majority of the players want to play, but um, I think you go to that school not accepting that you're going to be the 12th man, but thinking that I know there are a lot of great players here, but I think I can outplay some of them and I can earn my time. I don't think a player would ever go to a program knowing that they're the 12th man. I, I think they go into that program saying, I know I've got three guys ahead of me that I have to beat, but I think I can beat them. And if I can't beat them, I'm going to get better every day in practice. And, uh, and I'm going to make sure my coach does his job and tells some of these D2s or other programs that, hey, I'm pretty good, too. And get me an opportunity to show my skills on film, you know, film practice. Um, and what, what better film could you get than a, a great film in practice where you're going up against three high majors? So, you know, th that could be a very beneficial thing. But I would talk to the coach. I would say, listen. I'm willing to come here, but do you film your practices? Would you be, would you allow me to film the practice? Would you fight for me 
to get to another program because that will ultimately make you better. Yeah. And I got a kid now and we're talking to a triple A school and a couple of double A schools and single A school and the triple A school. He's like, no, I want that. I think I'm good enough to play there and, and contribute. And I want good teammates around me. So it, it, once again, it comes down to kind of personal preference. So, and that's good. You know, you, you, if that's what they want, yeah. then, you know, that that's the end of the story because uh, you don't want to convince them to do something they don't want to do because then you're going to be the one to blame. So, yeah. all right. Next question. Everybody that reaches out to me and pretty much everyone that plays for you and everyone across the landscape uh, of high school ball wants to play in college. And most everyone wants to play D one, right? You've been coaching since the eighties and you know, from your experience, what it takes to be a D1 player, right? So do you have a prescription out there uh, of what players that are D1 level talent have versus non-D1 players? You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, obviously it's another one of these situations where you go down to, to preference. I think a lot of these guys that don't look like Division One players uh, are Division One players and can be Division One players. And I think for me, uh, you know, if you want to be a Division One player, you have to have the intangibles. And I think that's a lot of things that people, they're, they're sometimes immeasurable, you know, competitive greatness, um, willingness to sacrifice, uh, never say die kind of stuff. And then you have to have some sense of, of basketball IQ, a high level of it. You have to have uh, skill. It just can't be an athlete. Uh, I know for me, when I talk to my players, it starts on the defensive end. If you can lock somebody up, that's a very good athlete. Uh, there'll be a place for you. Can you make open shots? Do you not turn the ball over? I mean, every, every position has a different requirement. You know, if you're a big kid, are you physical? Can you rebound? Can you run a lane? Can you catch the ball in the post? If you're a guard, can you defend the ball and not turn it over high, have a high assist to turnover ratio, a uh, lead talk. Um, if you're a wing, can you, can you score on all three levels? You know, can you do things on the floor athletically to compete? Do you have a long wingspan? You know, there's so many factors that go into it. Uh, I, I, I've sent kids to the Division One level that I think uh, going into it, we're probably uh, at a D2 ceiling. But because of their basketball IQ and, and how much they work, uh, just elevate themselves to a, to a mid-major or, uh, you know, to a level that many people didn't think they could reach. Um, and then I've coached guys that were high majors that flamed out and ended up going, you know, to a lower level program that they shouldn't really be at, but that's because of their work ethic and their basketball IQ and their laziness. And so there's a lot of intangibles. And I think people always ask me and I'll, I've been all over the world, you know, and I remember walking into a, a gym in a foreign country and saying, that guy's a division one player. And I got laughed at, you know, and people were like, are you a clown? You're a joke. You know, there's no way. And I said, I'm just telling you just based on the way he plays and how he plays, I know he's only 16, but, you know, and I got laughed at and then he's now in the NBA. So, you know, it's like you, you just see it. You can sense it when you see a guy on the floor. But a lot of it is on the intangible side. And don't tell me you're too small to play at the Division One level. I mean, you can go through history. There's been a lot of under six foot players that have led the nation in scoring. So uh, don't tell me you're too small, too skinny, too this, too that. Um, it comes down to a lot of those intangibles. Yeah, so you're handed what your, your height, weight and genetics when you're born. But you can improve your IQ. You can play defense. That's something that's learned, right? Um, hustle. So all this stuff can be acquired no matter how tall you are. What, what's the hardest thing to acquire for a player? Is it the IQ? Is no, no. I think that's the, I think that's the easiest. Um, you know, I think, I think becoming a shooter is easy. Uh, when I say easy, it's a skill that you can obtain if you put the amount of hours that are required. It's not easy like you're just going to roll out of bed and start shooting threes. But you can be a great – anybody can be a great shooter. And you could look at Steph Curry. And uh, he has a YouTube clip I just absolutely love about how when he was a sophomore or junior in high school, he was a good shooter, but he shot horribly. He shot from his chin. He's skinny and scrawny. Nobody recruited him. And then his dad took him in. And I think in one summer, he changed his shot completely and the rest is history. Anybody can be a great shooter if you put the amount of time in that he's put in. Um, shooting does not require size or speed or athleticism. It doesn't require anything. Basketball IQ requires work. We'll study the film, watch games. You could have an amazing uh, basketball IQ by just watching games every night, listening to these announcers, listening to the coaches that are talking to you on the film, watching your own film, studying it. Um, basketball IQ is easy to obtain, but you have to watch endless hours of film. You know, you, you have to be passionate about it. 
Um, again, uh, a basketball IQ isn't sitting down and taking a written test. You know, it's watching film, just, you know, thousands of hours of film. Uh, for me, there are some things that are, you know, it's tough to, you know, uh, develop lateral foot speed, let's say. You really got to get in the gym and you got to do it. Some kids are just limited. They just cannot get faster. Um, they can't get quicker. Uh, they can maybe get one step quicker on the first step but they just can't get up and down the floor. So for me, the hardest thing to obtain is that athleticism sometimes. Sometimes you're just not born with it. So if you're not born with it, then you have to figure out, okay, what skill sets can I have that can lend itself to a division one, two or three program and, and, and allow me to be a, a role, uh, take a big role on that team. And, you know, and we'll get into this topic down the road, but too many people think D1. You know, uh, there are some high level D3s and great division three programs, NAIA, division one, division two, uh, junior college basketball is basketball. But a lot of these guys get stuck on D1 and never think about the fact that, you know, there are some high quality D2s, threes and all that. But um, for me, in my years of coaching, it's always harder to to develop that athleticism and speed. Uh, so then you say, listen, son, you just don't have the speed, but we can use you in this way. You know, you, you're a good player in a zone offense against it or, you know, little things like that. So that that's my that's been my experience. Can you give me an example of one of your players who was not born athletically, but, you know, got the max level that they could IQ wise and shooting wise and, uh, um, you know, maybe not laterally or quickly, but that, that that got to that level by doing all that stuff you just mentioned? Oh, I have, I have you know probably 20 or 30 examples. And, you know, there was a guy that was my manager as a junior in high school, just probably 15 years ago, um, you know, couldn't even make the team, but loved it so much and had a passion for it. I wanted to keep him in the program. Um, and I think it, he was my manager as a sophomore, junior year, played maybe five minutes a game, if that on the varsity. And then senior year, he grew, he blew up a little bit, um, went D3 and then played pro ball in Germany. So um, there's a lot of examples of kids like that, late bloomers, guys that grow late. Um, but if you have a high basketball IQ, that does make you quicker. You know, if you know where a guy is going to go, if you did your homework and you know he likes to go right and do this, and when he goes left, he does that, that makes you quicker. And, and I always tell kids, if you're not quick of foot, get quick of thought. You know, use your brains and, and basketball IQ and study the film and read the scouting report, and, and that will make you a step quicker. Knowing that he's not good going left, making him go left makes you a better defender. So um, there are a ton of examples. I'm coaching a kid right now who's a sophomore who is a fantastic shooter and uh, playing really well in his high school team. He's limited athletically, but he went from about five, nine to six, four and uh, still a little bit unathletic, but he'll, he's only a sophomore. And I think he'll end up being a scholarship athlete because of his work ethic and his passion and his basketball IQ, but he's limited athletically, you know, so we have to find a way to use him off of screens and, and he has to be good on the defensive end and be more of a team defender versus an on-ball defender. Yeah. Next question. Um, what are three skills that kids can work on on their own that are going to give them the most bang for their buck or three well, workouts or thrill, three drills? Well, for me, I, I think that uh, basketball IQ is a skill, you know, um, that and, and I think that's number one. I say it all the time to kids when I, tell, when I give my speeches or I'm traveling around the world. How many games do you watch? If you don't like watching basketball, if you go home and you'd rather watch a movie or play on video games and do all that, then you're not going to get to that high level. You know, you, you have to have a passion and a desire to watch games. So for me, the number one thing that you can develop at home is your basketball IQ. And you have no idea how much better you become with a high basketball IQ and mental toughness. You know, it all comes in one. Um, but shooting is a skill that you can get really good at. You just have to put the time in. You have to have a coach that understands what it takes to get better no dip, get the shot off in 0.5 seconds, you know, catch and shoot quick, Clay Thompson-like. And, um, you know, you can be a, a really good shooter and ball handler. You know, shooting, you do need a gym. But sitting at home, you don't have a gym. It's snowing. You're on the East Coast. Uh, ball handling, uh, you know, basketball IQ, uh, defensive footwork, sitting in a stance, doing, doing stance work at home by yourself. There's a million things you can do to get better. Not a million, but, you know a lot of things you can do to get better at home that will allow you to improve yourself on the court. I, you, I can't tell you how many times college coaches have reached out to me that have players that played for me and they'll say to me, wow, his IQ is off the charts. I mean, he, I had him run the drills the other day. I had him uh, running film. 
I, you know, on a timeout, I asked him what he thought. Uh, it, it's just amazing. This kid, I, had a, I, I, I mean, this must have been maybe two weeks ago. You know, you're coming off the horn screen, and we always teach to help off the weak side. You know, that if you're coming off the horn screen up the top of the key, that the open guy is going to be the opposite corner. Um, we teach that pass. And I had a player that's playing at a prep school that makes that pass consistently. And a college coach reached out to him and said, we have juniors in our program that can't do that. So, you know, you, that, that goes back to the first question you asked about coaching. You know, when, when you pick a coach, what kind of system do they run? If they play zone, dump them right away. I mean, you don't want to play for a coach of zones. All right, slight technical dif difficulty there with, uh, with the sound going out. But Dave was pretty much saying that, you know, the IQ of your players uh, is noted by college coaches when your kids get to that level. Yeah, and just making the right reads and playing the right style, playing the right system. And, and like I had said earlier, you know, going back to your first question, you know, if you pick, you know, what AU program do you, do you choose? Well, you want to choose one that plays a college style of game. You know, you don't want to pick an AU program that plays zone defense or just traps all the time and just plays full court press. Uh, you, you college coaches want to see more. They want to see you play in the half court. They want to see you run a half court offense. And they want to see you run what we would consider college sets. Um, they don't need to see you come down and, and you know, uh, take 35 seconds off the clock every time because there's no shot clock. So, you know, when you pick a coach in a program, you want to pick one that's going to be conducive to what you want to do at the next level. But, um, you know, going back to your question, basketball IQ, uh, footwork, um, ball handling, those are things you can easily do at home. Yeah, that's good stuff there. Um, how about this? Do players need you have a trainer? No. Uh, in, I'm old school though. So, I mean, who knows nowadays, everybody thinks they need a trainer. You need a good coach. Um, you know, I train on my own. You, I would just train on my own. Most players have, you know, on YouTube. Now there's so many things you can do and drills. You can, you can, you can get off of YouTube. Um, you film yourself on your iPhone. It takes you no effort at all to film yourself doing a drill in the gym. And then if you have a real coach, you say, coach, I'm going to send this to you. Let me know your thoughts. You know, I, you know how many times I've had players send me things and say, Tell me what you think, coach. Now, my players don't because I film everything, but I've had players from around the world send me video and tell me, how's my shot look? Well, you're dipping it. Your, your release is low. Um, it's a slow shot. You're about at 1.2. You need to fix this and this and this. Now, if they need to come see me to do some drills to help them with that, that's fine. But you don't need I, – I think the trainer is, is kind of an overrated thing um, if you have a real good coach. You only need a trainer if, if your coach isn't very good. All right. Say my coach is not very good and I do need a trainer. How do you, what's your criteria for hiring a trainer? Um, for me, you know, uh, again, it comes down to uh, due diligence, seeing how they work guys out, seeing what drills they put together. Um, a lot of the guys do the same drills over and over again, you know, and then, you know, you watch a guy and is he on his phone all the time or is he, you know, is he, uh, you know, talking to other people or what kind of drills does he have you do? Um, but for me, if I'm looking for a trainer, I want someone that's going to fix me, not work me out. I, I don't need someone to work me out. I can work out on my own. I, I don't need someone to sit there and make me do drills and say, good, go harder. Uh, I, don't, I don't need that. I need a guy that's going to say, your shot's off. Here's how you fix it. Your, your footwork is bad. Here's how you fix it. Um, and, then, and then what kind of, uh, you know, what, what kind of reputation does he have? What kind of uh, resume does he have? Has he played at the highest levels? You know, I, so many times I have these trainers that never played in college and they're going to try and tell me how to get to college. Then I would say, well, why didn't you get to college? Oh, well, you know, I didn't work hard enough. Well, you know, I mean, I want someone that's been there that knows what it's like to come out of that locker room facing a guy, you know, four inches taller, 30 pounds stronger. And how am I going to beat him? What am I going to do to be better than him? Um, so many of these guys, like I always used to joke about, you know, they're holding signs up on a street corner saying we'll train for money. You know, so um, there's so many of them out there. But, you know, where have they been? Who have they worked out? And, and make sure they don't just one of those guys who takes a picture with uh, LeBron and says, yeah, I worked him out. You know, uh, you know, do your due diligence and find out who they actually did work out. But can you make me better? I, I don't care about you coaching me to do hard, go hard in drills. I don't need drills. I need you to get me better and to fix my shot, fix my footwork, um, fix my offhand. Give me drills I can do on that. And then after I get that basic, um, I don't need to keep going back. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to push a button here. What are your thoughts on cones and tennis balls? Well, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's different, man. I, you know, 
there's people that really believe in it and that's great. And I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that that's the completely wrong way to go. I just like being more realistic, you know, yeah. instead of going to that cone, I'll say, go to the elbow or I'll say, you know, go to that spot and, and, you know, cross over there and, um, tennis balls, you know, I don't, I don't mind it so much if you're at home and you want to throw some, you know, tennis balls up against the wall and do all that stuff. But I've seen some whacked out things, man, with these guys trying to do these drills. I remember finger weights, they put weights on their fingers and start doing this and to get their fingers stronger and they would sell it to you for 55 95, you know, and I'm like, you know, a lot of these things are not required and not necessary, but you know, guys like cones and you know, I think cones maybe, or those little dots are better for like 10, 11, 12 year olds, maybe, you know, where they don't know what an elbow is, but I've never used them. I always say, this is the elbow. That's a short corner. That's the mid post. That's the low post. That's the high post. That's top of the key. Um, that's a wing. Um, I want you to dribble to the wing, cross over, pull up at the right elbow, you know, whatever the case may be. I want them to know the basketball language. And, you know, you're not, my philosophy is always, you're not going to have codes and dots on the court. Right. So you have to be able to play without those. Right. I just wanted to push a button there. Cause I know you're passionate yeah, know. about, know. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next question. You've had a lot of players come to you for advice on which college to choose. What advice do you give a player coming to you saying, Hey, I've got these options here. What do you think? Well, that's a great one. That That is a question I do get quite often. And, and my response is always universal, which is I'm not going there. Uh, it's not my life. Uh, you know, but if I know you and I know what kind of player you are and what kind of dreams you have, I can tell you why well, I know you. Uh, you want to go uh, play pro ball overseas somewhere. That's your objective. Well, then you want to go here or there or, you know, wherever I would say. But for, for players that I have in my program, I say make a list. You know, uh, what's what's your top priority? Because everyone's different. Some guys, I have to go D1. I don't care where it is. I'll go to North Dakota if I can go D1. Um, other guys, I, I don't want to leave the East Coast. I don't want to leave the West Coast. Other guys, I want to go West. Um, other guys, I have to go where they have my major. I want to be a you know marine biologist, and I want to go somewhere that's going to have a great department in that area. Um, where we live, my, my location. I don't want to go cold. I, there's so many different things. you know. And I've had players that I felt were Division One players that settled for a lower level program because of the academics. And, and, you know, they would say to me, I'm sorry if I disappointed you coach. I, I, how could you disappoint me? You go where you want to go, yeah. you know, and, and it's not about me and you're not disappointing me because you're proving to me that you're a man enough to make the decision on your own, not through your parents, not through your coaches, uh, not through your friends, girlfriends, whoever, but uh, you have the ability to make your own decisions. And if it works out great, if it doesn't, you only have yourself to blame. So, um, you know, for me, I have to get to know the kid. I know what he wants and doesn't want. And then I can advise them. Now, these days are different uh, with COVID. I mean, you know, I've never said these things until this last couple of years, you know, where now I'll say something like, listen, this is a really good offer you might need to take because, you know, with COVID, you, you, it's, it's the great unknown. And with this transfer portal, you, you have no idea what's coming. And uh, you turn this down and you might not have anything. So you got to weigh those options too. So, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I always back away and say, you make the call. Don't talk, you know, get advice from everybody. But at the end of the day, you have to be good with the decision you made. Yeah. Speaking of the transfer portal, what are your thoughts on the transfer portal? No, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's good and bad. You know, I, I, I really do believe that. I think it's bad in, for the game. I think it's uh, good for the player. I think for the game itself, and I'm an old school guy, you know, you don't like the way the coach yelled at you at practice, you just go into the transfer portal, you know, and then now it's changed the scheme of everything. It's really hurt the high school player. Uh, the transfer portal has killed the high school player uh, and maybe even to a certain extent, the prep school player as well, because, you know, uh, I've talked to so many coaches. I Like, as you know, I have, you know, hundreds of college coaching friends and they have told me they got, they have guys now that are hired specifically to recruit out of the portal. Um, that they are not going to make any decisions on any high school kids until the portal is done. So it's really just really changed the landscape of everything. Back in the good old days, if you, if you transferred, you had to sit out a year, and that deterred a lot of people. Um, back in the way back days, you couldn't even do that because you had a five-year uh, five scholarship and you couldn't get out of it. But, um, you know, it, it, I think it's bad for the game. But if you're a player that you don't think you've had a good fit and you can jump right into the portal and go somewhere else, you know, it's beneficial, but it's also scary, you know, because if I decide I'm going to leave and go to the portal, there might be 3,000, 5,000, 7, who knows how many people are going to be in that portal. And now you're back to square one where you have to go back and sell yourself. And 
if you're not a guy with a big name, big resume, great film, um, it, it's scary. You're right back into that into that bubble of trying to find a place that's going to take you. I know guys that went to the bubble and now they're out of basketball. I know guys that went to the bubble and they went from D1 to D3 and they're not happy, but they had no other options. And then I know guys that went to the bubble and, and went to that portal and and they got into the best situation and now they're starting on a division one school. So um, you know, there's stories that go both ways. If you're asking me as an old school guy, I don't like it. I, I don't like it um, because I think it's just bad for the game. And you have so many guys now. You watch a game now, as you know, I watch games every night, you know, multiple games. And what you hear more than anything is, he went to Seton Hall last year. He went to Kentucky last year. He went to UCLA last year. And, you know, now they don't talk about their high schools and, and prep schools. They talk about what, what school they transferred from. I think Baylor won the national championship with a bunch of those guys. So um, it's really changed everything. And I think for coaches that are old school, um, they don't like it. And I think a lot of them want to get out of it because of it. Yeah, I think a couple of these old school coaches are probably trying it for a couple of years. And if they don't like it, they're going to go back to developing. But once again, it's start developing a kid and he doesn't like something has a bad practice he's gone yeah if you get on a kid you know and you're doing your job as a coach and you're pushing somebody and you know you're you're trying to make him better and you're really challenging him and you call him out on film one day but you're being honest and it's true he doesn't like it because he's sensitive and weak well then he transfers out and most of those guys don't make it anyways but um but you're right that's the sensitivity side of it where coaches are now afraid to coach mm -hmm. because now if i get too hard on this kid he's gone or if I don't give him minutes, he's gone. Or, um, you know, it's just a scary environment, I think. And, uh, you, you know, five years ago, we wouldn't have COVID and this portal that played such a massive role. But I've really seen it damage high school players. And high school players are the ones being punished the most. Yeah, absolutely. Now, with that, parents are going to get involved with transferring and, and picking colleges and whatnot. And you have been very strong proponent about parents' behavior for years. Uh, why don't you tell me how that can help or hinder a kid's uh, college chances? Yeah, if, if, if you're in college, I don't want to hear from your parents. I just don't. I mean, I, you know, even in high school, I have, you know, I weed them out. You know, if I have a kid that, you know, I'll tell you this. I just made a post about this recently, but the worst age is 10U. It's, it's amazing how bad parents are at the 10U level. With a 10-year-old, they can barely make a layup and can dribble with their offhand. My parents are in the stands just screaming. But I always tell parents, just stay out of the way. You know, encourage your child, uh, support your child, um, listen to them, um, you know, uh, give them a, a place to vent maybe, but don't, don't get involved. Don't, don't try and coach them. Um, now, there's exceptions, of course, but I know a lot of college coaches that have kids. Uh, they don't coach their kids. You know, they, they let the coach do their job. Uh, they, they know what it's like to be in that environment. So, you know, parents can cause a lot more damage than good. You know, if I'm recruiting a kid, which I did for five years, and I and I'm and his dad is or mom or grandparents or whatever is overly involved and and playing like a parent agent, I just move on. You know, unless the kid is a LeBron freak type player, even then it's just like, man, this is going to be a headache for three years. It's not worth it. It ruins team chemistry. The kids won't like them. I have to answer to this parent if my if I take him out one time. You know, parents do more harm than good in most situations uh we don't want to hear from the parents i don't care about what a parent thinks of this child obviously they're biased uh every every parent period uh will be biased towards their child it's human nature so i don't know too many parents are going to say yeah my son's not very good you know but they some you know the, the former players who are parents would say you know my son's good but he's not a division one talent he's he's more and i've seen that you know if you watch that steph curry thing i think it's e60 on on uh on YouTube. It's a fantastic video. But even Steph Curry's dad said something that was kind of funny when someone said, you know, I think your son's really pretty good. I think he's going to make it to the next level. And his dad's quote was like, yeah, he might play overseas for a couple of years. You know, so that's a guy who kind of gets it. So when, when his son blew up, I don't think he even anticipated that. But um, parents involved in the transfer stuff and the portal and calling coaches usually ends up in being a disaster. There's exceptions, of course, but uh, usually a coach does not want to hear from a parent at the next level. Yeah, to chime in on what you just said about uh, Del Curry, you know, one of my clients this year is a kid whose dad's a D1 head coach. And, you know, when I asked the dad, like, tell me about your son's game. Well, he needs to improve in this. He's not very good at this. And all I did was, was downplay him. And I was like, yeah, well, your son's got D1 talent and he does a lot of things good. And all the dad said was the negative things, which I actually appreciated because he's looking at it from a, a, a you know, a D1 coach's perspective. 
right? He's looking at it as he's looking at his son as a coach to a player, not as a father to a son. Yeah, it was refreshing. And, it yeah, was refreshing. it's great. It's, and I think a lot of coaches are like that at the higher levels. I think they get it. You know, they know it. And then, I, you know, I, I can't stand these parents who would say, listen, I played I played college ball and my, my son's D1. We're just going to wait and wait till he gets these offers. I'm like, my gosh, you're so lost. You know, you have no idea. He's not a D1 talent. He's a good player. He can play at the division three level. He can have a great career, but you're putting this pressure on him. He's not going to be able to, to prove. And he's not that guy. So sometimes parents, they just live through their kids. And, and like I said, nothing's worse than a 10 you, you go sit in the bleachers during a 10 you game and just leave your recorder on. And some of the comments you hear, and you look at these parents and you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't think you could run the 40 yard dash in under 10 minutes. I, I really doubt you've ever played a game. And yet you're telling everyone in the stands, how great your son is and how bad the coach is. So um, parents, sometimes they have good intentions, but they don't realize that they're making it worse. And when I was recruiting players, I'm looking at the parental behavior in the stands. Are they standing up and chewing out the ref? Are they standing up and yelling at the coach? Are they yelling at the other team? Are they yelling at their teammates to get their son the ball? Are they, you know, if I, I watch all that, when you're recruiting a kid at that level, you have to do like a deep dive background investigation, man. So you're looking at who they hang out with and what the parent behavior is in the stands and, and those things do play a factor. If you've got two players that are very similar, these parents are great to work with, professional, don't get in the way. And this parent's a loud mouth. You're going, you're going the other way. Let me ask you this. Since you've been coaching high school ball since the 80s, what, what's caused this change? Do you know what the reasoning is? Well, I think it's the same reasoning that goes on with social media and everything else. I think it's just a, a different day and age. Uh, you know, I think it started with the fact that, that, uh, coaches try to win for the shoe sponsorship there wasn't a lot of this in the olden days but you know they want to get paid they want to make their money they want to go to high levels so they bring in kids they make promises to players and i'm talking about the high level type programs but even those those programs that aren't they so want to win they so want to to make money that they're willing to take those bad behaviors and tolerate it if it means it's going to give you a couple wins mm. um you know and with social media now the way everything blows up and the way these kids are self promoters. And, and uh, you know, I got middle school kids making posts that they're scoring 40 and I'm looking at the game and it's a disaster of a game who cares, but they're self promoting at the age of, you know, 13 and 12. Um, but, you know, parents, you know, these are the parents now uh, they weren't our parents, you know, our parents had it rougher and tougher and didn't have all this stuff going on. So these new millennials, wherever you want to call them, um, they've lived under the social media site and guidelines for so long now that uh, I, I just think they live too much through their kids. Yeah, you know what I love, and you probably get this comment a lot too, is my son locked up a kid that signed in Michigan State uh, on a Sunday afternoon game. Therefore, I think uh, Tom Ezra should give my son a scholarship. I when hear I hear that, that, I'm just like, you have no okay. effing clue what you're talking about. My, you know, my cousin, my, uh, my, my, uh, our nephew, my nephew went and signed at Houston. And, and, and my son's better than him. He should be going to a place better than Houston. And, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, he's not better. Maybe your nephew took it easy on him in a backyard game one day, but he doesn't have what it takes to get to that level. And, and I will tell you that, that you know, I, I have had parents that have caused so many problems that, um, you know, rushing on a court after the game, yelling at a ref, you know, and college coaches just shake their head. And I'm looking at these coaches and they just, you know, we just kind of, I ran NCAA tournaments for 15, 20 years in LA with the pumps. And you, you would get to know these coaches and you would just go up and talk to them and say, you know, man, what is going on? And, and this coach would say to me, that's a division one talent. Who no one's going to sign him because of the baggage he brings. So uh, again, it just comes down to, and they learn that baggage early and they never get told to shut up. And that's why I'll lose players. Like I probably lost one player this year at the lower level because he constantly emailed and complained about whatever. And I just, you know, I just made it to the point where I said, let's just, I want him to leave. And he did leave because he didn't like my response. So, but you, you until these parents learn to shut up, it, it they'll never change. And I'll go, I'm going to go to a high school game tonight to watch some of my players. And the, the parents in the stands are yelling the entire game at what their kids are supposed to do. That's the coach's problem. You know, a coach can solve that in a, in a second. You know, if I'm coaching a game and the parents are coaching their kids on the game, in the game, during the game, from the bleachers, I just take the kid out. I have done this, and you know me, you know me, Corey. I've, I'm, I've done things that people would say he never really did that. But I took a kid out of a high-level game and said, go sit in the bleachers. And he's like looking at me, coach, what do you mean? Your dad's coaching you. 
go sit right next to him or you're off the team. I want you to walk over there and just sit next to him for the rest of the game. Since he's coaching you and you're listening to him, then you go sit next to him. And that was the last problem I had with that parent. So again, it's like coaches can solve these problems, but they're too afraid of the parent and yeah. you, you, you can't coach that way. I want you to share a story. It's, it's my favorite story of you dealing with parents ever. And it's about uh, a 40 point blowout and parents in the stand yelling at your uh, timekeeper about a point they were off. Can you just share that story? Cause I, oh, I love that one. And that happens a lot too. I mean, that's happened to me a dozen, a dozen times where, you know, on both sides where we're up 40 or down 40. Um, but you know, there was a game where I think we were probably down 25 or so or, or up. Uh, and the dad in the stands is just going crazy because they forgot a point on the scoreboard. And there's like three minutes left and they're up by like 22. And I just, you know, I run over, I, I stop the game. You know, I call, I stop it. I walk over the scoreboard to the scorekeeper and the score was like, let's say, you know, 72 to 44, 45. I said, I want you to give them 92 points and give me four, make it 92 to four. And then I'm going to walk over to that parent and say, is that good enough for you now? Are you happy now? Is the score good for you now? Because you're embarrassing your son and you're embarrassing everyone else. In the gym. You're up by 23 with three minutes to go. One point's not going to make a difference. Shut your mouth and just let the kids play. And I've done that on numerous occasions. I've run camps and tournaments where parents are complaining about the score. And when I was running the, the term, I just shut the score off. I turned the score off and I had them keep score on the bench, on the table, and just let the coaches know what the score was. So the fans couldn't see the score. And the fans lost it. The parents were crazy and coming up to me and screaming. I say, you're out of the tournament now. If you continue to argue with me, you're out. The reason I turned it off is because you're embarrassing yourself and you're making the tournament a disgrace. Shut your mouth, whatever the score says, and I'll put it back on. So I left the tournament off the whole. I left the scores off of every game that team played. The coaches knew the score. Coaches would know it. The, 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 the people on the team would know it, but I didn't let the fans know it. So that, again, comes down to parents where they just don't know when to shut up. Yeah, and just a quick story, personal one, on uh, my experience with that is my mom flew in to Colorado to watch me play a game. And before the game, I said, hey, coach, uh, just letting you know my mom's here. My mom waved and you waved back. And I didn't play the whole game. And uh, afterwards, I said, hey, uh, you kind of forgot to put me in. My mom flew out. And you said, yeah, you're not special. And, uh, you know, uh, just because your mommy flies out doesn't mean I'm going to play you which is fair. So the next time my mom came in, I said, look, you have to sit in the uh, rafters of the stadium. Uh, I'm not going to mention you're here. So just, you just have to do that. And, and then I played, but it was all about putting the team first, no special privileges. You had to earn your playing time. And that's one other thing I want to give you credit to, like our practices determined who played. So a walk-on could play if he was kicking everyone's butt versus a starter. So every game we had different lineups and you could earn it. And it was pure meritocracy, which was just refreshing. And you don't see that very often. And I'm glad you brought that up. And I remember one of the things I told you was like, so what? So now if anybody wants to play, they just have to fly their dad in or have their dad come to the game. And I got to automatically play them. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a good fit for you. You played a lot last game. I'm not going to play you much this game because it's not a good type of team that you're going to dominate. So, but you're so right. And, you know, when your team, I just made a post about this too, but a coach is responsible for the chemistry of a team. The coach is responsible for how a team plays not you know and and a coach has to have that feel and for me i've always been considered a player's coach um because i coach as if i was coaching myself and i know when i played that i want to know that it, i have a chance to play in every game that if i come out and i outplay the best player i'm going to get on the court so uh i have done that my entire career and all my players know it which makes practices very competitive and i'll make the announcement and say listen obviously you're not ready to play today so uh, Franklin, you're starting tomorrow and, you know, D, you're sitting down and, and I'll consider putting you in based on how you finish this practice out. Well, he doesn't come to practice half speed anymore. And I, I it builds the chemistry of the team. So uh, I, I really do believe in that. But not a lot of coaches will do that. They have to play their stars. They have to play their best players. They have to win. And uh, what they don't understand is if you do it this way, you'll win more than you lose down the road. Uh, you, you might win in one or two games, but everybody hates that player because he comes in late, doesn't go hard and then he shoots 25 times a game, you lose guys, you know, and you lose the respect of your team. And that matters more for, for most coaches than winning a game. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, here's a topic I want to get into that just fascinates me. Um, I learned a stat the, a few weeks ago that only 5,000 players have ever played in the NBA since it's, since it's start. 5,000. I think at that number, 
you have a better chance of winning the lottery than playing in the NBA, right? But so many kids want to do it. You see a guy like LeBron James who grew up with a single mom and, you know, he's a, he's a physical specimen that's unlike most others. And he made it to be one of the best players ever. You got a guy like Kobe who grew up the son of a pro athlete in a foreign country. You've got guys like Clay Thompson and Steph Curry who grew up in NBA households. And then you've got kids that, that come from, to, from nothing, right, with, with very tough situations. And what I'm trying to do, and I've asked a lot of coaches this that have coached NBA players and been around them, like, what did these guys possess that got them to that level? Because everyone, Dave, is looking for that prescription, right? So they can just do exactly what these guys did to, to get to the NBA. You've worked with a lot of NBA players throughout your career. You've been up close with them. And do you have a – do these players have a – something inside them that you can foster and create or is it something you're born with or is it something that happens to you can you provide any insight on what you might see as a common denominator between all these players well wow, that's a million dollar question i mean if i could i'd be a billionaire you know, I know if, right? if there was something i could do that that say this is what it takes to get there there's so many intangibles um you know and and uh like you know you're i'm very blessed that i have worked with so many uh, players on every level from, from just high school guys to guys that went to college and had great college careers and then never played again. And guys that played overseas. Um, one of my favorite players, Aaron Max, he's been playing overseas, played for probably 25 years and had a phenomenal career, just phenomenal. I think he's still playing today, um, probably 40. And, uh, and then I've had guys that have made it all the way to the NBA, NBA all-stars, NBA hall of famers that I've, uh, I'm not going to sit here and say I coached them, but I've had relationships with them or I've seen them develop, uh, when they were younger. And, you know, you look at some of these guys, you know, you just name some uh, Curry Thompson, James Harden. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of guys that came out of the area that I was very prominent in uh, Paul George. But when you look at the fact that, that none of those guys were very high recruits, like uh, Clay Thompson went to Washington state. Um, Paul George went to Fresno state. Um, James Harden went to Arizona state, good schools, but not Duke, North Carolina, Michigan state, Kansas, uh, not SEC, not ACC usually, um, but, you know, what made them become these Hall of Famers that they are now Davidson, nobody even recruited Steph Curry. Um, he's not a physical specimen. He's not someone that's going to walk in a, in a building and you're going to turn your head. Um, so I think it's those intangibles. You know, it really does come down to it, to, to your passion. And I bring it up all the time to my players. Are you passionate about basketball? And I'll have 100 kids in my gym and I'll say maybe three of you have that. And by Pat, well, what's passion, coach? Passion is a love for something that you can't do without. Meaning, if you told me, Dave Taylor, you cannot watch basketball games for a year, I, I don't know what I would do with myself. I, I don't know, I don't know how I would exist. Like, I don't know what I would do with my life if I couldn't be involved in sports in one way or another, watching it, coaching it, playing it. Um, you know, but if you're if you're if you don't have that passion and that love and that desire. And then you combine that with competitive spirit. You, you have the competitiveness that, you know, when you get beat, when people say you can't do it, you just say, you're wrong. I'm going to prove it to you. Do you have that fire in you that is just a competitor? You've heard so many stories about the greatest players of all time, the Magics and the Michaels, that they just are so competitive. You don't even play checkers with them because they're just going to throw the board across the plane. So, you know, there's so many of these little things that if you have a passion, you're going to overachieve. And I, I always tell kids, it's not about being a pro. It's not about being division one. It's not about, it's about overachieving. If you have the physical talent athletically to be a division three player, but you play division two, then you are a massive success. If you are a guy that, that, you know, limit was limited, but you found a way to play professional basketball for three years in Rome or, or in Belgium or, or, you know, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, what a, you, you win, you overachieved, but, there is no magic pill. There is no, you know, you can't make somebody passionate about basketball. Right. You know, I can't just go to you, Corey, you've got a ton of talent, your size, you have people in your family have, have played your DNA is phenomenal. You have to love basketball, go home and love it. it. It doesn't work. You know, you just can't fake that. So for me, the one ingredient that matters more than anything is the passion that they just can't live without it. The number two for me is the competitiveness. Yeah, let me ask you this. Where did your passion come from? Because you, did you come out of the womb with passion or did something plant that seed within you? I, I you know, uh, that's a great question. I, it was something I always had, but I, I, I probably attributed to my dad. Um, my dad was a football guy. 
And uh, I played sports my whole life growing up and all my friends did. And I just loved it. And I think that being introduced to it, that's what a parent should do. I think a parent's responsibility um, is to basically introduce their children to different things in life, you know, and then let them run with it. You know, I send my daughter to a, a soccer thing and uh, she's really good, but she comes home and says, I just hate it. I don't like it. It's not fun. Then don't play. Um, you know, I, I put my daughter in a tennis camp and she's horrible and she's hideous and she can't hit the ball across the net, but she loves it. Mm. And she wants to watch it on tennis channel and she wants to go play every day, dad. And she's seven years old. She's going to make it somewhere. She'll play somewhere. She'll go to some college and probably get a tennis scholarship. So, you know, once the parent introduces the child to an event, it's up to the child to show you and to demonstrate to you as a parent that they really, really want this. If you have to say to your kid, Hey, did you work out today? Hey, uh, the Lakers are playing the Knicks or Duke's playing Carolina tonight. You want to watch? Eh, not really. I'm going to go upstairs and, you know, go on Instagram. They don't have that. And you can't force them. No, you're going to sit here and watch with me. It, it doesn't work. They'll just get turned off and not want it even more. So for me, I was introduced to it by my dad. Um, and it, a funny story is I didn't like him coaching me. I didn't want him coaching me, but I just, he watched it. I watched it. I fell in love with it and I ran with it. So to me, it was in my DNA. But if I had a father that didn't like sports, never played sports and was into music, maybe I'd have been a musician. I don't know. But once I was introduced to it, I, I ran with it. That's interesting because that's almost that's almost inside you that you're born with, I think. Yeah. And, and, and think about this. You and I could have both been like, oh, here's the example I use. Michael Phelps. If Michael Phelps at 6'6 was born in Lexington, Kentucky, he's not swimming. They're putting him on a basketball team. If I'm born in Baltimore and have his mom and get introduced to a pool, maybe I've won 12 gold medals, right? So there is so much talent out there that probably just never had a mentor or an adult exposed them to something that they would have been excellent at, right? And I guess all of those 5,000 players, since it is like winning the lottery, it was, it was lightning in a bottle where your dad introduced basketball to you. Because if your dad yeah. is just not a sports guy, which there's plenty of guys that aren't, you have a different life trajectory. So maybe it's, maybe it's luck. A lot of it's luck. And well, a lot of it is luck. Places. Of I mean, to get a start, to get the passion start is luck. Maybe well, and, I always say, and I always say you're a product of your environment. So depending on which environment you live in, some guys live in an environment where basketball is their way out. So they looked at it like that and they took it like that. And they really developed their passion and love as a way out. Um, others might, you know, look at it as, you know, you have a kid who's got, you know, LeBron's talents, but everything's been handed to him, let's say, and he's never had to work for anything. And his parents, you know, sugarcoated everything and never let him fall down. And then he doesn't turn out to be the player he is. You know, I've worked with players like uh, I remember DeMarcus Cousins always talking about how he was a football guy. You, know, you look at him, he's huge. He was a football guy and he grew up in Alabama and Alabama's football, you know, and and uh, but then when he walked on the basketball court, he just fell in love with it. And you know how many people probably told him, no, football, go to offensive line, be a stud, D-line, whatever. But he fell in love with basketball and the rest, he kind of just took off. Um, so it really does come down to, like you said, a lot of it is luck. And, and a lot of that luck falls on the parent, you know. And I know for me, um, I want to I want to provide my daughters with opportunities to play everything and do everything. Gymnastics, uh, music, uh, things that I don't even like. You know, hey, let's go do uh, uh, play the piano. You know, if you love it, then let's continue to do it, even though it's not something for me. Um, and I'm not going to force my kids to do something that I want them to do. Hey, I was a great player. I want you to play basketball. You're my daughter. You're playing basketball. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You know, so but I do. I have found out recently in my limited years of parenting that they do want to please me. So they do want to play basketball. They do want to coach, you know, so that's like a natural thing. So as a parent, I wanted my dad to see me dominate on the football field. I was a football player, you know, cause he played football. I wanted my dad to say, wow, what a great game. And then, uh, you know, then as I got older, I didn't need that anymore, but I just fell in love with the sport. So, um, you know, it really is something that's inside you, Corey. It's not, you just can't fake it. You know, you can't, I remember my mom telling a story to all my friends or my, my relatives, like she would leave me at home back in the day when I was probably 11, 12 years old, she'd go run to the store and come back. And, uh, you know, my aunt would be like, what are you doing? You're going to leave him home alone. And she's like, Oh, the baseball game's on. He's not going anywhere. You know, he's going to sit right in front of that radio, by the way, and just listen to Vince Scully. And she was right. And, um, 
but I, that, that was a story she told when I was probably 10 or nine. So I've always been somebody that's just loves sports. And I think uh, for me, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to make a living out of it. Yeah. And with this new generation, having the video games, having the social media and you being around the game so much, are there still kids that have that passion for basketball or is there too much distraction now versus like an old school player? Well, there's way more distractions, but I did, they're still out there. Okay. Uh, it just depends. You know, a lot of these kids, um, I always say it's better if you live in an area where you, or you live in an environment where you don't have a ton of money to just waste on playing video games, getting to PS five and 35 different games and, um, buying all the top level shoes, but you have to, you know, go out and just play. You know, I, I, I'm going to make a post here soon about, I think the one missing ingredient and no one ever talks about, I think one of the biggest missing ingredients in today's game is the park. Uh, I think so many players, including myself, really grew up at a park where you played against grown men coming out of work at the factory. And I, when I grew up in, in the Compton area and, and Gardena, California, and and uh, we would go to these parks and these guys would get you know, out of work at five and they go back to that park and they were out of shape, old, um, but man, they could play and they could teach you things and they could work with you and they would hit you and they would make you tougher. And, and but playing at the park um, really improved my game because you couldn't go in there. There's no refs. There's no air conditioning. You know, you had to go out there and earn your way because if you didn't, they'd kick you out of the park. Um, I remember I would be, the, you know, you know, the only high school kid on the court. So, uh, but I, it took me a long time to get on there. And if I call a foul, you're just, they would say things to me that are so funny nowadays, but I remember this old guy would play with a cigarette in his mouth and he would light it up for like 20 a game. It was like, and I remember one time I said, but he fouled me, man. He goes, okay, that's it. Three weeks. Do not come to this park for three weeks. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't own this park. But my response was, yes, sir. And I didn't come back for three weeks. And then when I came back three weeks later, he goes, oh, I've been taking the date. You're allowed, but one more complaint is six weeks. And you just learned from playing at the park that, that uh, man, it made you tougher. It made you better. The wind, you couldn't shoot threes. You had to go take the ball to the basket and get beat up. But I, we really missed those parks. I don't, I don't even know of anybody that plays at a park anymore. And when they do, it's just, a, it, it's just hideous, you know, to watch. But um, that's a real big difference now. And they don't because there's so many gyms, so many arenas, so many – AAU teams, um, so many venues to play at, um, but it, it's a detriment to the player. But, you know, like you had said, it's, it's a different day and age. So many distractions. You know, for me, the distraction growing up would have been going to the beach, yeah. you know, but, you know, and, and but I, I didn't know who knows, you know, if I had a ton of money and if I had video game systems and everything was handed to me, who knows where I'd be right now. So um, I had the greatest childhood and the greatest life and I have no complaints and I really do think sometimes when you're spoon fed a lot of things and you're given things as a kid that your work ethic deteriorates. Yeah, I think so too. You don't have that edge, but that's what makes Steph Curry and Clay Thompson so interesting, right? They yeah. in theory had that stuff handed to them. Didn't have to uh, have as many adverse um, situations in their life. So that's what those guys always confound me. Right. Yeah. But I think that, you know, like you and I said earlier, I think Steph Curry's dad was very grounded you know, and didn't even, didn't, didn't talk about his son being a phenomenal super. I mean, Steph Curry's alma mater only offered him a, a preferred walk-on spot. So right. he really wasn't handed anything. Um, just, you know, he was handed free admission to the NBA game, you know, but nobody, like, even if your dad's alma mater doesn't offer you a scholarship, you're not really given anything. And that's why, and that, that 12 minute video is so great because he remember he, his dad would talk about, he came to him and said, I really want to play in college now. And his dad's like, well, we got to fix that shot because that shot's not, not going to get you there. And I think Michael Thompson, I was around that California area a little bit and, and got to see a little bit and hear a little bit, very grounded, figured it out, knew that, Hey, you know, you're not, this isn't going to be easy. You're going to have to do it like this, this, and this. And uh, you know, and then there's other guys who have, I mean, you would think, you know, Jordan's kids um, would have been, you know, all NBA players, but sometimes they're just simply not good enough or they just don't have what their dad had. And I don't know much about them, but I know they made it to college. They played, I think. And, um, but that's got to be a hard life to live too, you know, being Michael Jordan's kid. So, um, but the expectations that people are going to have about you. So it really is just kind of a, there's no formula that you can look at. If it was that easy, everybody would follow that formula. I know, I know. It's trying to crack the impossible code right here. But the uh, last thing I want to get into is you see kids now that specialize from a very young age and only play one sport. 
And we all know now that wear and tear is happening. We're starting to see injuries. You've been a big proponent all along about playing multiple sports and then specializing. And tell me a little bit more about that. And then tell me about tennis and why you think that's such a good sport for basketball players. Well, tennis might be, it's weird. If I had to re, you know, rate the, the sports I love the most, tennis is right up there. I've been to every, uh, in fact, I'm going to Paris this year and I've been to every, you know, grand slam event multiple times. Uh, just absolutely love tennis. I think tennis, you have to be so mentally tough. Uh, it really teaches you to be mentally tough. It, it gives you great footwork, hand-eye coordination, so much of it. The one thing you don't have, obviously, is the physical contact. But, man, you got some guys, some of these guys are out there for five hours, and, and it, it is it is brutal. Um, but I've always been, like you said, a proponent of playing multiple sports. But I don't think you should ignore the other sports while you're playing one, meaning – I'm playing basketball now. I still have to find time to get to the cage once a week, once every 10 days and, and, and get some rips off off the cage, you know, and hit the ball around. I have to find a way to get the soccer ball in the backyard and go play a little dribble tag or dribble the ball a little bit to stay and maintain my, my conditioning on the soccer field. Um, you know, you still can't ignore it. I mean, you're playing baseball. You just can't say, I'm not going to touch a basketball for four months and then think you're going to come back and be any good. There's time to find, to go out and just rip off some jumpers, you know, twice a week for half an hour each. Um, but every sport helps the other one, you know, soccer and tennis help basketball with their footwork. Uh, football helps you with the toughness, football, lacrosse, that kind of stuff helps you with your physical toughness. Um, you know, there's all kind baseball helps you with hand-eye coordination, you know, there, every sport will help the other one. So, uh, and then I always say, if you're really good at one of them, you know, maybe your junior year, you narrow it down, mm. you know, junior year of high school, you say, I'm getting offered 15 division one scholarships here. Um, I like football, but I'm not very good at it. And I'm a backup, but if I go out there and shatter my knee, uh, I might lose those offers. So I'll narrow it down my junior year and focus on that one sport. Now, if you're not being recruited in any of them, go ahead and play all of them. But like, there's so many stories of the Allen Iversons of the world that were great football players and, and obviously great basketball players. Um, but uh, you know, for me and my advice would be, you know, play as many sports as you can but don't ignore the other sports. And also when you realize that one of these sports can get you a free education, maybe your junior year, you start to narrow that down. And in the summer, you have to play in certain events. You know, you have to play in certain AAU events that are going to be seen by college coaches. And maybe you can't make the, the, the baseball trip, you know? So um, that's when you have to kind of start narrowing it down. Usually your sophomore, not sophomore, junior, senior year in high school, I think. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Great answers. Hey, quick lightning round. You ready? Sure. Favorite movie of all time. Gladiator. Who's the best player you've ever coached? By the way, the way, let me, let me, let me just, let me just back up. I just okay. watched Miracle again. It's like the 37th time. M Miracle's really good, man. If you're a coach, some of the things that guy did were awesome. And I, 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 I watched that with the commitment and bringing the team together. And when they were looking at the girls in that one, you know, game and, and the, the game was tied and they were just clowning around and the way he made them work out after the game and, Miracles is, is climbing. It's always been a top 10 for me, but Gladiator for me has always been my favorite. Gotcha. <laughs> Best player you've ever coached against? Oh, coached against? It wow. just tore you up. You know what? There, there's so many. I, I couldn't name one. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not going to name names, but we've played against guys who are top 20 players that did not impress me. And that could have been because they didn't take a serious or they, they went light. And then there's other guys who were just average players, D2, D3 guys that just, we could not stop that. We just could not, and in the pick and roll, they just found a way to beat us and, and we couldn't stay in front of them. And they kept getting to the rim or they were defending us so tight and we couldn't get them off of us. And uh, they were usually the player that's the toughest to stop is the post guy. And you see about one of those every 75 games, you know, but if you see a dominant low post guy that can just command doubles and triples and physically, dominate inside you can't stop that guy because even when you don't when you keep the ball out of their hands they just get grab offensive rebounds and they just put it back in and and i don't have a lot of six ten guys i've had a few pretty good bigs trust me but when you face that really that that dominant beast of a post um you know we front it we double down we triple down we press we do a lot of different things we we put him in pick and roll on the other end to see if he'll get in foul trouble. We make him play defense on the perimeter. We do a lot of them. But if they're just a man child in there and just grabbing rebounds, you just have no answer for it. I look at my kid who's, you know, 6'4 and a buck 95, and he's going up against 6'9, 290. 
I just look at he looks at me and I just smile like you try <laughs> you're trying but he's just throwing you to the wall but I, I you know I've coached against and with so many great players um I couldn't narrow it down to one okay last one what's the biggest win of your career oh man that's tough so too, with your history I know that well it's just so many but there's so many little ones um Give me one of your you know, first one, one of your first when you were first starting. Because I know those stick in the brain more than Yeah, others. well, my first year I coached a team that went 0 17 for the year before. So uh I came in and and I'll never forget my first game. I got a technical within three minutes because I was out of the box. I didn't know what a box was. So a box. We I gotta stand right here in this box. But um, you know, we beat some teams uh that we shouldn't have beat. I think when I was in LA, we beat Long Beach Poly. Um, and the LA times had a little blurb saying it was the upset of the year in, Ca in Southern California. Um, you know, we played modern day and beating them in low level tournaments as far as not, not, uh, not high school seasons, but like in summer leagues and stuff like that, where they're really loaded and we're playing them in a tournament somewhere. Um, and then there's a game where, you know, I was coaching an eighth grade team and, uh, we're playing against this super team. That's also in eighth grade. And they're, I think they were 25 and oh, and. They had banners everywhere. It was the last game of the year. They were undefeated. They had really, really amazing talent. And, uh, you know, we were an average team, probably 10 and 10, you know, 10 and 12. And uh, we're down 25, 30 and a half, you know, and, and rightfully so. This team was loaded. And I just said, listen, guys, you know, we're getting good looks. You're just missing them. Okay, you don't quit. Just keep pushing. Just keep pushing. Don't listen to the crowd because we're in their gym and they're playing music. And, and uh, you know, and we just – slowly and and during the game they were trying to throw alley-oops they had guys that were shooting free throws with their offhand laughing um pointing at us and so i would just remind them of that once in a while like hey you know they're making a joke out of you guys next thing you know we're down like 12 and then you know i have all five timeouts which i don't know why we would have five left but they give you five in this league so we would score a timeout foul score a timeout bottom line we hit a, a three at the buzzer to uh to beat them uh they ended up winning the whole thing in the playoffs Never came close to losing, but they had that one loss. And, uh, you know, I made a post about it, but didn't name names, didn't name the schools, didn't name the teams. But everybody on the other team just hated me and started messaging me and calling me names. And I said, listen, and they had this one little kid, like the coach's kid. Every time they made a three, he'd run up and down the sideline with a bow and arrow. And he just bow and arrow everything and start. And they were just rubbing it in. It was just, if I had to really tell you, that was probably one of the most gratifying wins I've ever had. Because <laughs> to be down with eighth graders down by 25 against a team of that caliber on the road and blah, 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 blah. And parents just, you know, our parents just like, wow, this is bad. And then they come all the way back and win. And the ramifications of that were, were enormous. So, I mean, but I've had hundreds of wins like that, that, that if I had, you know, three hours, I can coaching uh, at the air force Academy, man, we had some great wins, you know, great wins on the road, stopping uh, uh, what was that? Uh, Western, Western Nebraska. Nebraska yeah. yeah. I had like a 90 game winning streak at home and we beat them on the road in their gym. Their coach who I love tremendously. I thought he was a great guy came into our locker room, which you were a part of, I believe, and said, wow, we've never been beaten like that before. And you guys really gave it to us. And they had a huge home court advantage and, and, and professional talent on that team. And, uh, we, we beat them down the stretch and shocked the world. And, and, um, I just got tons of games like that, you know, and, and whether it be at air force or, um, you know, in high school. And, and like I said, eighth grade and I'll coach a 10 U game and just be so proud of them. And it'll, it'll give me a feeling of enjoyment for, for years, you know, just to be so proud of, you know, and I like the, I like the teams that overcome, you know, and overachieve, you know, I, I my greatest memories I've taken teams that in California, we had teams with the double pumps that just, you know, if we won a game by less than 30, it was a loss. And, and guys on that team, I had five NBA players on that team that I was helping out with. So, I don't really have great memories of those games because they were just so easy and so easy to blow out. It's the ones that you coach those, those teams that just take that next step. Yeah, absolutely. And it was fun to be a part of those with you all those years ago at air force. But, uh, well, look, we covered a lot of good stuff today. I really wanted to make sure on this episode that we were talking about some of the main topics that players and their families deal with today and questions you and I get uh, on a weekly basis. So I just want to get your point of view on that, just so people have more information to where they can make uh, a better decision about their son's future, right? Or daughter's future. So uh, thanks so much for that. You know, you're a brother to me. I respect you. I've learned I, uh, my basketball IQ went up exponentially uh, for the time I spent with you. And, you know, obviously we work together now and travel the world. So I'm just grateful for you. And I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your knowledge base with everyone out there who's going to listen. Well, I'm very proud of the man you've become and, and what you're doing in life. And, uh, 
you know, I, I couldn't be more proud of anyone. So uh, to see, I talk about you quite often and you're part of my life and my program and uh, you've helped so many of my kids get to that next level. And I thank you for that. And, um, but the one thing I say more than anything is just how proud I am of you and, and coaching you. I always knew you had that in you. And then, you know, I've, I've always been very hard on you. We won't get into that, but I've always, and I, when I coached you, I was really hard on you. And, um, but there was a reason for that. And I always say that to kids that if a coach isn't hard on you, then he doesn't believe in you. Right. Um, you know, some of these kids get yelled at and they take it personal, you know, and they're like, Oh, he hates me. I hate him. I don't want to play anymore. I tell my kids, if I'm not yelling at you, then I don't think you're very good. So when I yell at you, you should almost smile inside. Like, wow, he must think I'm really good because he's mad at me because I, I made that mistake. He thinks I'm better than that. So the worst thing you can do to it, to my opinion, to a player and even to a kid, if you're raising them is to ignore them. Yeah. You know, if you just ignore them, that that's the worst thing you can do. So I'm very proud of who you've become and, and uh, have hundreds of stories coaching you that we'll get into one day for a four hour podcast, but um, very proud of who you are as a man and, and, uh, and as, a, as, as a father more than anything. So thank you for that. Keep doing the good work you're doing. And, and I'm sure we'll be in, in, uh, in partnerships for years to come. Absolutely. Well, folks, thanks for listening in today to the prep athletics podcast with our esteemed guest coach, Dave Taylor. And uh, if you like what you hear, feel free to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms, subscribe on YouTube, which has, uh, you know, bonus content, sign up for our newsletter. And if you have any questions about basketball or post-grad or prep schools, feel free to email me. I'll get back to you. I read every single email that comes my way. And uh, we're here to share information and help you make the best informed decision. Uh, so with that being said, be safe out there. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week.